All right, today I'm going to be redoing an older sermon from 2011 called The Marks of a False Convert. It's probably one of the most important sermons I've ever preached. And I know a lot of people have, um, you know, watched it, they, you know, heard the audio because it was never recorded as a video. It was back when we had Bible Believers Fellowship, our house church, and we would record audio sermons for sermon audio. Um, and it was never made into a video. So I'm going to be making it into a video today. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a testimony here, uh, I was a false convert for a good number of years. From the time I was eight years old was when I made a profession of faith, and uh, I was not tr truly saved. I, I, I did some really, really wicked, vile things, and um, I definitely was not a Christian. I could not have told you in all those years that I knew for sure I was going to go to heaven when I died. Um, I'd make fun of the Word of God, the King James Bible, in that time period as a professing Christian, um, going to church buildings and things like that. Um, a lot of people would have thought I was probably a moral person, but I was very wicked. I was a pornography addict. Um, I you know, used profanity. I went to public school, and I was in the popular crowd for you know, my last couple of years of high school, and, and uh, just you know, party scene vandalism. Um, got out I was a real as they say excuse the term but hell raiser um, I was very much into fast motorcycles fast cars uh, I was not a Christian and it wasn't till years and years later when I was 25 years old I was in the art world at the time working as a professional artist and uh, wood turning wood carving is what I was doing exhibiting my work in galleries and art shows and I just became extremely disillusioned with life and I just was like what is the point What's the point of this whole thing? Whole time professing Christian, too, by the way. And I just got to a point where I just, I remember I thought, you know, at one point in time, I'd been like, I'd rather be in art, the art world, than, than you know, if I had to give that up, I'd rather just die. I mean, it was so important to me. It was my whole life. I put everything I had into my work. And I got to a point where I just, I literally was like, I don't care if I'd never make another piece. I don't care if I never go to another art show or another art gallery takes my work or I sell another piece or whatever else. I could have cared less. I wanted to know God personally, um, not through some little profession that I was brainwashed into back in Sunday school as a little boy, uh, having no knowledge of my own personal sin, having no real knowledge of what Jesus Christ did on the cross to pay for my sin, not understanding that. And um, I finally came to the Lord broken. And just, I mean, I was I was ready for, for suicide at that point. I was just like, if Lord, if this isn't real or whatever, there's no point in even living. And uh, the Lord saved me when I called upon His name in faith and saying, I put my faith on what Jesus Christ did on the cross to pay for my sins. He saved me at that point in time. But before then, I was a false convert. And there's a lot of false converts, unfortunately, because of man-made systems. And again, all those years, I never knew that there were no church buildings in the Bible. I never understood that there are two different streams of Bibles. There are, is a King James Bible comes from a totally different line of manuscripts than like the NIV or the New American Standard or a lot of those other ones, the English Standard Version. I had no idea that there's actually two different Bibles. Um, the Catholics, they talk about other Bibles, other books that are in their Bible. That's because their Bibles come from another part of the world. There's Egyptian Bibles, and then there's Syrian Bibles. This is a Syrian Bible, the King James Bible. I had no idea about any of this stuff. I didn't know anything, really, except for some basics that I got taught in Sunday school and church buildings growing up. I had no idea. I did not know the truth. Um, thankful that the Lord saved me. So let's get into the study now. Okay, I have here most statistics for professing Christians. That's very important. In America, stand right around 75%. Now, this was back in 2011. Here we are in 2017. This was August the 7th of 2011 when I originally preached this study. Um, so here we are in, um, I'm not even sure what today is, October something of uh, 2017 mid-October 2017. So I don't think the number of professing Christians in America is 75% anymore. Um, but what I have here is, if America is 75% saved, then how do you explain the wickedness? Absolutely. 
Um, could there be some false converts? Now let's just look at the thing scientifically. Is it possible that um, in all the people out there that profess to be Christians, could there be a possibility of even one false convert? You say, well, yeah, I think there could be. What if you're one of those, as I once was? I would have been greatly offended had somebody come to me in my past before I got saved and they would have said to me, you're not a real Christian. I would have been greatly offended by that because I hadn't reached that point in my life in many of the years where I was broken. When I was broken and somebody would come and told me that, when I was just finished with this world and whatever, somebody would come and say, hey, you know what, you're not a real Christian. I would have said, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Let me illustrate my point, though. Okay? Real versus fake Christians. I'm going to tell you something today. You ready? See this? See? I'm Superman. See, where's the S at? Well, I don't have it on this shirt, but uh, the reality of, of the thing is I've hidden this for from people for a long time. Uh, I'm Superman. I don't know if you knew that or not. You say, what? Huh? <laughs> Are you on something? A lot of people wonder that, but uh, no. <laughs> um, do you believe me simply because I said that I'm Superman? No. Um, do I have to prove that I'm Superman? Yes. Again, let's just look at this thing scientifically. If I claim to be Superman, then I'm going to have to offer some proof of that. Right? Here are the qualifications to be Superman. Number one, can you fly by yourself without an airplane? No. Uh, that's a problem. Number two, can I shoot red laser beams out of my eyes, take my glasses off? No. Can I bend, bend thick bars of steel? No. Unless it's heated. <laughs> no. Not of my own strength. Can I pick up cars? No. But you see, I feel like Superman. And I said that I am Superman, so that should be enough, right? No. So let me ask you a question. Why would it be different for a Christian who says that they're saved and has the Holy Spirit of God in them? Let me tell you something. Um, the Bible teaches that when you get saved, you are one flesh with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God dwells within you. The Bible says that your body is the temple of God. Isn't that greater than Superman? And you mean to tell me that there should be no proof? Somebody comes along and they say, I'm a Christian. Where's the proof? You need to have some signs of Holy Spirit power. Now, are there false converts mentioned in Scripture? Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We'll see about the thing of false converts in Scripture. Verse 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Um, I can tell you back when I was a professing Christian, before I got saved, I never once prophesied in, God, in, the, in the name of Jesus Christ. I never once cast out devils. I never once did many wonderful works. I went on mission trips and stuff like that. Maybe you could say there's some wonderful works there. But I didn't do all that stuff. And yet the Lord tells these people in verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Hmm. Acts chapter 20. Next to Acts chapter 20. 
And you see, what you really need to do is you need to be following along in a King James Bible to make sure that I'm telling you the truth about the Scriptures. It doesn't matter about my feelings or my opinions or your feelings and your opinions. It matters what does the Word of God say. That's what's important. Acts chapter 20, verse 29 through 31 it says here, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. Hmm. Does that sound like there are some false people, false prophets coming in among the body of Christ? Yeah. And I can tell you since 2011 when this sermon was first preached, the number of false prophets and false professing Christians has, I don't even know what number it would be. It's not quadrupled. quadrupled. It's just exploded exponentially. It's just, it's so far beyond what I could even calculate. It's, it's so frustrating seeing how many false preachers, false Christians are out there. They're all over the place. Turn next to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You talk about scary. You know what the number one profession for a Satanist is? A real true worshiper of the devil? In church buildings. They appear as the ministers of righteousness. Some of the most wicked, evil people that you will ever meet worship regularly behind the doors of a church. Look at how many children are being molested. Not only by Catholic priests, but Baptist priests. I mean, oh, excuse me, preachers. Had a friend growing up, uh, was molested by a Methodist worker at a, at a summer camp. Years and years later, finally couldn't take any more of all the torture and torment and everything else that was going on in his mind. Blew his brains out. Done by a religious man. Not a Catholic. It's rampant. I mean, it's just an epidemic in the Catholic Church. But it's going on in the others too. These Protestant churches. But oh, there are no false converts out there. Yes, there are. There are a lot of false professing Christians. In fact, the vast majority are false professing Christians. Make sure that you're not one of them. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. Watch out when you hear these charismatic people saying, I'm the apostle so-and-so. I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle, apostle, apostle. They're not apostles. The Bible test for an apostle is that one of the things is they have to have those sign gifts that were given there um, to convert the Jews. Basically, the Jews require a sign. And they also had to be an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. All right? People today don't have that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. Look at that verse. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Um, you're going to find that out. When you truly are saved, you won't. You, you know, if you're saved, you don't understand very well what I'm talking about here. False brethren, you will be in perils among false brethren many times. You get around these people, you think that they're Christians, and all of a sudden, the, the ugly spirit starts to come out of them, and you realize, uh oh, you know, these people aren't brothers and sisters in Christ. And see, if you're an atheist out there, you're some other lost person, whatever you are, you look at the body of Christ, the professing 
Christian church out there and you see the rotten mess that it is, you're looking at false brethren as well as saved brethren and you're lumping them us all together. We're not all together. And if you get saved, you'll understand it very, very well. You'll understand the threats that come from false brethren. The most nasty, rotten, mean comments that I get on this channel are from professing Christians, both Catholic and Protestant. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've dealt with people, members of the Church of Satan, that are more cordial and more uh, educated in some of their attacks and things. But you get these professing Christians. My word. Second Peter chapter two. Go back to Second Peter chapter two. verses 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Check that one out. They're going to be the popular channels on YouTube. They're going to be the ones with the big church buildings and the big movements and everything else. Those Bible-believing Christians that stick to the King James Bible and have very small subscriber numbers, those are the ones that are going to be telling you the truth, and the big ones attack them. Happens all the time. Verse 3, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. They'll put on a show. And they have covetousness. They'll come out and they'll say, uh, oh, you know, I'm so thankful that you could tune in. And, they'll, and they'll, they'll change their voice and they get into all this stuff and everything else. They put on a little show. They draw you in with enticing words of men's wisdom. They make merchandise of you. Again, I remember uh, a brother said the one time, he said, uh, if I was an atheist, he said, I'd be a faith healer. Why? You can make a lot of money. Yeah. Conning religious people. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Let's read that. Talking more about these false converts. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge, notice that, the knowledge, it's just up here, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his, vomit, to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Let me just see something here quick. I don't know if I have that DVD here right now. Yeah, right here. Just to show you two good examples of this, okay? Put this, my notes down and my Bible down here. They have knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. False converts. Right here is a DVD. The story of William Carey. Uh, trying to see. I'm not sure what the guy's name is, this actor. But this guy right here. This actor. In the post-production thing where they talk to the actors and stuff like this. I mean, his... his, his Acting is, is beautiful when he's, he's pretending that he's William Carey and you know, he's, that's his character for the movie. And it's just so moving. It moves you to tears as he talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and how Jesus can save you and, and he's preaching the word and all this other stuff. And they showed post-production stuff and he's just sitting there just flippantly and he, and he uses profanity. And one of the quotes or one of the things that, the questions that they'd asked him and just like, nah, it's a job. That's all it is for these people. They're actors. They can learn the lines and act like a Christian. Just like a lot of people that go to church. In fact, I would say the vast majority of people in church buildings can learn the lines and they know how to act like a Christian. You see, they have the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, but no heartfelt conviction. Here's another one. The story of William Tyndale.
that guy right there. And I uh, can't think of what his name is here. I'm not sure what his name is, but he's a Hollywood actor. He was in the uh, Cheers TV show. Um, I remember watching that as a lost man. And this guy was one of the actors in that show. And um, turns out he's a sodomite. Practicing sodomite today. But he's going to portray one of the greatest men in Christian history. Moving scenes where he talks about Jesus Christ. And I would be willing to die for translating the Word of God into the English. It's fake. It's a fraud. But you want me to believe that everybody out there that professes to be a Christian is on their way to heaven. It's not what the Bible teaches. And it's not what common sense teaches either. Let's continue. First John chapter 2, verse 18 through 19. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now check this out. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Oh, Brother Brian, there's no fruit or there's no, you know, nothing there after salvation that you have to do to prove that you're saved. Oh, I beg to differ. Okay. Works before salvation to get you to the point where God grants you repentance or something because you've really cleaned your life up. That's heresy. That's Lordship salvation. But what happens after you get saved? Works meet for repentance. Bible talks about there needs to be some changes there but you'll see these people I have seen this thing my word I've seen it so much in my ministry years of ministry 10 years now and I've seen this thing over and over and over again people that were once strong Bible believing professing Bible believing Christians and things happen in the world and they off they go they go back to the world and now they're enemies of the ministry it's absolutely incredible. Okay. Question for you. Are these, I'm going to read some words for you, are these the words of a Christian about Jesus Christ? Quote, the Holy One of God. You heard somebody say that? I believe that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Does that sound like the words of a Christian? How about Christ the Son of God? You're at somebody out in public or you're at some Babel building, church building thing. I call them Babel buildings because that's what they're all about. They're about talking. They're social clubs. But you're at some place like that and you hear somebody say, I believe Jesus is, is Christ, the Son of God. There's some preacher standing up there. Jesus is the Holy One of God. Are they the words of a Christian? Let's look at Luke chapter 4, verses 33 through 44. I'll show you who spoke those words there. Luke chapter 4. Verse 33 through 34. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And yet you would think, if you hear somebody out in the world say it, you'd think that they're saved and they're a Christian. It's a devil speaking through them. Look over at Luke chapter 4, verse 41. And devils, came also, or, and devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. It wasn't yet revealed what was going to happen there with Jesus Christ. He was still there offering himself to the Jewish people as their Messiah. They rejected the things happened. But at that point he was saying, don't tell people who I am. But isn't it interesting there that devils came out of many, crying out and saying, thou art Christ the Son of God. 
and yet you walk into the average church building and you'll have people saying those exact same things and people look at them and say they're Christian. It's just belief. Just profession. James chapter 2, verse 19. James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Didn't we just read about that over in Luke chapter 4? Yeah. They believe that Jesus was God. He's the Holy One of God. They believed that. Of course they did. They believed, in fact, they trembled. They had reverence. But... Anybody that professes to be a Christian is a Christian, right? I don't think so. Titus chapter 1. You say, oh, this is such a condemning message. It's just, a, just such condemnation. You have such a hateful spirit. Um, no, actually a hateful spirit would be me keeping my mouth shut and letting you go to hell thinking that you're saved. I mean, again, I've, I've told this story different times. I remember we were going door to door the one time back when I was hardcore Baptist, Liberty Baptist Church, Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And we we're out there going door to door and, and we get to this guy's door and this guy comes out, kind of haggard looking guy. And we're like, you know, if you died today, do you know for sure where you would go? And he said, I think I'd go to heaven. And we said, uh, well, how do you know that? You know, not trying to argue with the guy or anything. We're just saying, trying to make sure. And he said, because that's what they tell me. Well, he said, excuse me? He said, well, he said, whenever I go to my wife's church, he said, the pastor there, he, you know, he t led me in this prayer and he tells me I'm saved. He told me I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven. And the brother was with me at the time, Brother Jesse, he said, uh, yeah, but, but do you personally know that you're going to go to heaven when you die? And the guy thought for a minute and he said, no, I don't. And Jesse said, does that concern you? And he said, yeah, actually it does. He said, you see, I just had a heart attack not long ago, and he said, I'm recovering from it. And he said, I'm, I'm actually quite worried about where I'm going to go when I die. And we were able to witness to the guy. Gave him some you know, gospel tract and things like that, and some literature and things, whatever. Did he get saved? I have no idea. It's one of the things he said, you know, I need to think about this. I need to pray about this and whatever else. But he was a professing Christian. Because his wife's pastor told him that he was. How sick. Titus chapter 1 verses 15 through 16. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They, did you see the people there in verse 15? The defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They, profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Their good works are self-serving. They'll do good things when it profits them. That's what I used to do. Yeah. I'd go to church buildings to pick up girls. Look and see if any girls were wearing mini skirts or tight clothing and stuff like that. Then sit there and lust after them. Oh, yeah. But I was a Christian, right? Because I professed to be a Christian. Because I prayed a prayer in Sunday school. Don't even tell me that. I professed that I knew God back years ago. But in works, I denied Him. I wasn't living like a Christian. And many of you out there, you're not living like a Christian. You don't know for sure. You can know for sure. The Bible says that. What's wrong with you? Why don't you know for sure? But let's continue here. Just looking at my notes here. I have a couple things written here. I'll just go through some of this. Uh, you know, this. there's this big thing. I talked about this in the original study back uh, all those years ago. Um, you know, this what would Jesus do? This whole thing. 
Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. When did Jesus ever mow a lawn? Like a lot of the modern churches do, they go out and they do charitable things. When did he ever sell baked goods? Or wash, I have chariots written here. You know, didn't have cars back then. When did he ever wash chariots? Or the, hey, let's put the disciples, we need some money, you know, we got to get some money things here. So let's just put on a, a chariot wash or something like this, a bake sale, whatever. Never happened. When did he organize a free clothing bank? Never. Jesus preached and healed and made the Jews so mad that they killed him. How many people do you think were mad at me? You know, pharisaical people, false religious type of people, back before I got saved. I didn't upset one person. Not one. I was loved by the world. Popular in high school. Popular in getting along with people in my secular jobs that I had. Nobody wanted to kill me. I got saved. Started studying the Bible. I started seeing friends drop away. I started seeing family members drop away. Didn't want to talk to me or be around me anymore. And then I got into ministry and started opening my mouth and telling people I believe this King James Bible is God's perfect word. It's the standard. And boy, things changed. All of a sudden, I could see what Jesus Christ went through. He was a perfect man. I'm a sinner. You know? But I can see how people hated him. And I can see that hatred coming upon me because I serve Jesus Christ. And you've seen it too if you're saved. You've seen things change. If you're a false professing Christian and gotten truly saved, you've seen the change. You know what I'm talking about. But you see these uh, Christians, Christians, churchgoers, they're not upsetting anybody. Only people that uh, argue with them are Bible believers. <laughs> pretty, pretty crazy. But uh, say two other things here I've written out. If I give people a good meal, a brand new car, and $10,000 in cash, and then send them down a road where I know the bridge is out, am I really showing them love? No. If you tell someone how to get to heaven without convicting them about their sin, then you are not showing them true love either. Absolutely. Salvation that removes repentance. When you remove that, that conviction of sin that when you come to, you know, to the end of yourself and you say, I'm a sinner, I'm wicked, I know I can't make it to heaven. You remove that from salvation, you are damning that person to hell. But let me ask you a question. Should you ever question your own salvation? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. You'll get people and they'll say, the devil's getting me to, to doubt my salvation. You know, well, you know, you don't want to doubt it all the time, but um, you might want to think about this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Okay, you're to examine yourself, whether ye be in the faith. I mean, people are so weird. They get offended when you tell them, make sure that you're saved. Oh, you're doubting my salvation. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. You, And then they'll cuss you out or something. And you go, whoa, okay, I'm just trying to, trying to make sure that you know what's important here. I am saved. I'm a Christian. Now leave me alone. I don't get offended if somebody comes up to me and witnesses to me. I mean, what in the world? Why would I get offended at that? I say, well, praise the Lord. I'm thankful that you're out witnessing to people and whatever, you know. But we are in this weird situation where people think that it's somehow wrong or bad to examine yourself to make sure that you're saved. To go over your life and say, Lord, I don't want to go to hell when I die. I mean, you're going to go to a place, if you're lost, if you don't get saved, if the Lord doesn't save you, I'll say it that way, if the Lord doesn't save you, you're going to go to a place where you're going to burn forever. No rest, day nor night, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, all the horrors of hell. You're going to go there forever. But they just say, oh, just pray the prayer. You're, you're in, you're in. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Are you crazy? It's the most important thing that you can do. Know where you're going to go when you die. There's nothing that's more important than that.
What is true salvation? Okay, let's go over that. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God. Okay? Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There's two parts to your salvation there that happen at the same time. You realize, I'm not going to make it. I am a wicked, vile sinner. My life, I've tried everything. I've tried to make myself happy with, you know, whatever you've tried. Sex, uh, money, covetousness, you know, having money and wanting things and stuff like that that you don't really need. Um, I've tried drugs. I've tried alcohol. I've tried travel. I've tried education. I've tried other religions. I've tried all this stuff. Nothing's working. And you come to the Lord broken and you just say, God, I don't know what on earth the truth is. I remember the night that I'd, I'll never forget that night as long as I live. I was out in my studio working on some uh, wooden bowls and things and stuff, getting them ready for art galleries and whatnot. And it was about 3 o'clock in the morning and I was just like, I, don't, I just don't know what the, the point of life is anymore. And I remember I walked outside and I looked up in the sky and I said, God, I just want wisdom. I don't know what the point in life is. I have, no, I have no direction anymore. Everything that I thought was important to me, it just it doesn't even matter anymore. What's the point of my life? Please, God, give me wisdom. I had no idea what James chapter 1, verse 7 says about, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. I couldn't have turned to that to save my life. I had no idea. But I had to have repentance toward God. I'm no longer self-righteous. I'm no longer saying I'm a good person. I think I can make it broken. I'm broken. My life is a mess. I need help. There was contrition there. Contrition means that you understand you're a sinner and you're sorry for those sins and you want to do something to change that life that you're having. Repentance. You're stopping dead in your tracks and saying, this life isn't working. I need to go somewhere else and try something else. You come to God in that broken, repentant, contrite spirit and you say, God, I need help. I want to change life. And faith in Jesus Christ is, I know He died on the cross. I can't see it. I wasn't there. I can't go back in a time machine to be there. But I believe that that death on the cross is enough to pay for my sins and to get me into heaven. I believe that that payment on the cross can wash my sins away and give me a new life. And I can be a new creature in Christ Jesus. And then with your help, God... You can help me to change this vile life that I have. You know, i got to say this too, a little bit of my testimony, and that is I had a lot of dreams. And the art world thing, it was okay, it was going all right, but it was really like I'm probably never going to achieve my dreams of living and having land. And, and I had all these, I want to build a cabin someday and, and all this other stuff. And it was just like, I don't see this stuff ever happening. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And he called me into the ministry, put me in the ministry. And now a lot of those old dreams that I had way back then, we're talking, uh, oh boy, the year 2000, you know, 17 years ago. A lot of those dreams that I had way back then are now being fulfilled right now after serving the Lord for 10 years. It's really something. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. I have a whole study on this. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus said that. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And I have here the easy believers of nuts come along and say that repentance comes after salvation because the lost can't know that they are sinners without the Holy Ghost. Okay. <laughs> All right. Luke 7, verses 36 through 39. We're going to see about this thing. They say lost people can't understand that they're sinners. They don't have the Holy Spirit to convict them. 
So they can't possibly understand that there are sins and that they need to turn from that sinful life and not turn from it and then get saved. Okay, You're turning from it in the sense of saying, this is rotten, this is miserable. God help me. God be merciful to me. You're turning away from that life and saying, I don't want that anymore. I want a new life in Christ Jesus. I'm at the end of my rope, Lord. you got to help me, please. That's what turning from sin means, repenting of your sin. That's what it means. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 39 and one of the Pharisees desired him that he should, or that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. The fact that she was a sinner was very well known by everybody around. So according to Scripture, what we read there in 1 Timothy 1.15 and Mark 2.17, she qualified for salvation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. She was known as being a sinner. She's qualified. Verse 40, Luke 7, verse 40 through 50. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she, has, she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with, with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath, hath saved thee, go in peace. She comes first as a sinner, broken. Everybody knows that she's a sinner. There's no question. She's not coming in self-righteous pride and saying, I'm not that bad of a person. I'll just sit down and kind of like maybe have an intellectual conversation with Jesus. She comes in, she's broken. She's making a fool out of herself, according to what most people would think. She's down there at the feet of Jesus. She's crying. She's taking her hair and wiping his feet off and she's kissing his feet and she puts ointment on, her, on his head. She comes broken as a sinner. False converts don't do that. False converts get caught up in the moment of a nice little uh, revival meeting or church service or whatever else and the music's just right and the lighting's just right and he says, come forward and pray the prayer or just stay in your seat, you know, repeat after me. And they pray this prayer. If you've prayed that prayer for the first time, then I can tell you that you're going to heaven when you die. You know, go on and live in like the world. Mm -mm. That's not what's going on there. Jesus forgave her sins because she came as a sinner and showed a broken, contrite spirit. And it was her faith that saved her. See the two parts there? Repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. Question. If a man or a woman wanted to live a life of sin and they prayed a prayer of salvation knowing that they were not going to give up their sins, would God be forced to save them simply because they believed in Jesus and prayed a prayer? It's a good question. What about an atheist mockingly crying out to God for salvation? I've had that happen. I've gotten into things with atheists and stuff and they'll go, Oh God, please save me. Oh, you know. 
I put my faith in you, and stuff like that. They'll mock. Is God forced to save them simply because they've prayed a prayer? Or does God look at the heart and say, it's not legitimate? If repentance has no part in salvation, then anybody can be saved simply by professing it. Luke chapter 18. Turn there. Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, verses 7 through 8. It says here, and, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Um, the elect in the passage there is the Jews that go into the time of Jacob's trouble. But uh, I kind of find it interesting that he says, when he comes back, the second coming, Will he find faith left on the earth? Okay. And I have here, notice the saving faith is a rare commodity when Jesus Christ returns. Yeah. You go into the time of Jacob's trouble, not going to be, not going to be that many people that believe in Jesus by the end of that thing. Those that are truly have believed in Jesus and stuff like that, they're getting slaughtered. Just horrible slaughter the whole way through the time of Jacob's trouble. Look at verse 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Just like church people. Self-righteousness is the problem with this Pharisee. Verse 13. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You know, it's a humbling thing to come before the Lord as a sinner and have to admit to what you really are. See, you covered up good, don't you? You get out in the world there, you're successful, you're doing a good job and stuff like this, and you get in your car and you put your sunglasses on and you're cool, you're driving and everything else. But inside, you're falling apart. Inwardly, you've got all kinds of doubts, all kinds of fears and everything else. I don't really know where I'm going to go when I die. I don't wonder if, that, if the Bible's true in it. I don't know. Fall apart. The Bible says there's no peace to the wicked. I know that. I lived for years as a professing Christian. You think I had peace? No. I went from one thing to the next. Searching for happiness. Searching for meaning in my life. Never could find it. Every single time I got something new, it was just like, this is it. This is it. I got it now. I found it. Fulfillment in my life. A little while later, I was dropping it. This isn't it. Yeah. I have here... Uh, most church people fall into the class of self-righteous do-gooders. You don't believe me? Ask them sometime if they're a wicked sinner. You have professing uh, Christian family members or co-workers or whatever else. Just go up to one of them and say, are you a wicked sinner? You'll get your answer very quickly. <laughs> You'll see that they're a Pharisee. <clears throat> Finally, will a true Christian sin? Okay, because see, that's another thing. They'll say, well, you believe repentance, so you're, you're totally broken and you'll never sin again after you're saved. Oh, please. I've never preached that. I've preached against it. Romans chapter 7. Go to the book of Romans chapter 7. See, it's not, you know, you, you know if, you're, if you're a false convert, well, you really got to be much more righteous 
and and merit your salvation or something like this. Oh my no. Oh my no. You need to be real with what you really are. Get rid of the illusions of you're a good person. You see? Real salvation is you coming to God broken as a sinner. I'm done, Lord. I'm done. I'm not going to try to earn heaven anymore by my own goodness, by my own works. If I had to stand before you right now, Lord, I would go to hell just as like lightning. And you'd be totally justified and send me there. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's salvation. If you've never done that, uh, get it sorted out quickly. Romans chapter 7, verse 23 through 25 the Apostle Paul writing, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Don't think that your flesh is going to get cleaned up when you get saved, okay? It's going to be a lifelong process of sanctification. And you will be shocked sometimes at how easily the devil will get you on certain sins. You'll just, you'll fall for some of the dumbest things and you'll go, why did I do that? I know better than that. That was so dumb. Why, don't, you know, struggling with your flesh. But you see, before salvation, when you're dead in trespasses and sins, you're always trying to make the flesh happy. You're always trying to appease the flesh. You know, whatever you do, you got to protect that flesh. You got to protect whatever makes you look good. You don't want to be the one sitting there at the at the table with the Lord, you know, and you got your all your silverware situated right, and you have your napkin on your lap, and you make sure that you don't put your elbows on the table, you know, and your proper etiquette and stuff like this. And here, and here comes this sinner, a woman. She comes running in falls down at the feet of Jesus, goes over and she's crying on his feet and kissing his feet and wiping it with her hair and think, oh, oh, how crude. Self-righteous Pharisee. Well, you shouldn't be talking this way, Brian, because I go to church. I'm a pastor. I have a PhD. I have a THD. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm part of Christ's church. <laughs> you know, all these different things. Are you a sinner? Are you a wicked sinner? Have you come to the Lord broken in a repentant, contrite spirit? Have you done that? Oh, well, you're a good person. Good people go to hell. Sinners go to heaven. Okay, I have here, I am not quick to judge a Christian who is sin in the flesh. Absolutely. I've seen Christians, they'll sin, they'll mess around with the flesh and things like that. They'll be chastening there. Watch my study on that. However, I will doubt the salvation when it shows up in the spiritual realm. Absolutely. You get these people, I'm a Christian. Do you believe the King James Bible? Oh no, it's a poor translation. It's this, it's that. What's the word of God? Well, you know, we have a collection of Greek and Hebrew. So what's your standard? Their standard is themselves. I'll judge somebody like that. Somebody comes along and they say, uh, I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm a Baptist. I'm a this. I'm a that. I'll look at what they believe. I'm going to judge whether they're saved or lost. And Christians are supposed to do that too, by the way. John chapter 16, verse 13 says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. John 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Remember what we read earlier in 1 John 4, 6? We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You want to judge if somebody is really truly saved or not? What is their attitude towards the truth of God's word? What's their attitude towards it? You'll get, you will be deceived as a Christian, okay? Especially early on. You're going to believe some really stupid things, all right? Um, I believed at one point in time, I mean, right when I first got saved, I thought that Roman Catholics and, you know, Orthodox Jews were saved and on their way to heaven. That's how dumb I was, okay? Lord straightened me out pretty quickly on that one. I was listening to Christian hot rock, roll, rock and roll and uh, heavy metal when I first got saved. 
The Lord straightened me out on that. I was still having pornography problems uh, when I first got saved. I was still still addicted to that stuff, and I had to fight and fight and get you know finally got victory over the thing. And looking back now, I realized one of the big problems there was the fact that I was going to church buildings while struggling with that addiction. And church buildings are ancient Greek pagan uh, temples. That's what they are. They're Parthenons. Look up an ancient Parthenon, a picture of a Parthenon, and put it beside a picture of a church building. And the steeple on top in architecture is known as an obelisk. It is an Egyptian phallic symbol. So you get a Greek pagan temple, Parthenon, with a phallic symbol on top, a statue of the male member, a Baal worship temple, is what those things would have been seen of or seen as in Bible times. And again, where are these things at in church history? The oldest ones, you know, the oldest Baptist church in America was built in 1700, you know, and later updated by the Rockefeller family. Don't want to make you think, you know. But you go to one of them places and you're having pornography problems. Gee, I wonder why. I wonder why there's so many sexual problems in these places. But you got to defend it because it's the old, you know, church and all that other stuff. Yeah. Sure you do. But let's conclude here. So when will the true Christians be proved? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 if you know anything at all about this ministry, you know where I'm going. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58, also called the Blessed Hope in the book of Titus. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Boy, am I looking forward to that. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Uh, the rapture. It's our blessed hope. Um, when's it going to be? I have no idea. I hope soon. But uh, when that time comes, you're going to see who the false converts were. And you're going to see who the real Christians were. There will be a separation at that point in time. We're leaving you know, it's funny because I used to, we used to hand out these things. I don't even know if I have one here. Um, one of the booklets that uh, Ruckman put out, I, don't, I can't see any right here right now, but uh, they said, millions disappear. You know, and I had pictures, you know, people coming up out of the grave and stuff like this, dead in Christ being raised, and then we which are alive and remain being caught up together. Millions disappear, you know. Um, I guess it'd be true if you included lost people, but, or excuse me, not lost people. Excuse me, dead people, dead saints. Excuse me, erase that first part, <laughs> not lost people. You know, but it's like, as time goes by, I'm going, okay, it's probably not going to be millions that disappear if you're talking about saved Christians. Maybe, you know, a couple hundred thousand, you know, and then it's like, okay, maybe tens of thousands disappear. And then now it's like, you know, maybe a few thousand <laughs> disappear. You know, uh, the passage in 1 John about they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. I'm seeing that thing so much. It's just incredible to me. Um, you're seeing it. I mean, I get it from the body of Christ a lot. You know, you're just like, it's incredible. I mean, these people, I thought this person was saved. I thought that they were a Christian and they're just totally a fraud. And you get this whole new, this whole new group of, of people. And I realize it could be some artificial intelligence, you know, goons posting comments and whatever. Not goons, but computers. Weird world that we live in. But there are people out there that profess to be Christians. And they're just like infiltrating and they're getting in. And then they like start trying to mess you up doctrinally. And it's like, I mean, in my worst times as a lost man, I never once tried to infiltrate a, any religious group and try to mess them up. I just, I can't fathom how evil these people are. But I'm, you know, coming to think, you know, as time goes by, it's just like I used to look and say, man, it's just going to be such a shock when the rapture happens. And, you know, 
millions disappear, and then a hundred thousand, you know, maybe a few thousand people disappear. Yeah, it's going to be this huge shock. I don't know anymore. I think when the rapture happens, I think a lot of people are just going to be like, yeah, good, they're out of here. I'm glad for that. You know, I mean, it's getting to that point uh, where people are so antagonistic towards you if you're a Bible-believing Christian. Uh, they'd be glad to see you gone. So that's going to be it for the study. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have been after me to uh, post my testimony. I'd, I had done a, a testimony recording years ago, audio only. Uh, I am going to be putting my whole testimony up uh, online some at some point in time. I'm um, going to be including photos and stuff of me growing up. It'll be interesting. Uh, at least to some people. You know, I realize that there are people that just click on my videos. As soon as a new one comes up, they click on so they can push the dislike button. <laughs> it's like I can make a video about, you know, like it's a sunny day and people like, I hate it. You know, I can't stand the video because because Brian's in it, so I hate it, so whatever. But, you know, I am going to be posting my testimony, uh, you know, more of a full thing on that eventually, but I've shared my testimony in this thing. Um, I was a false convert. Uh, Sunday school, eight years old. Uh, if, if you don't want to go to hell when you die, just raise your hand and we'll go out in the hall and we'll pray this prayer. Joyce Laycock was my Sunday school teacher, Calvary Monument Bible Church. I don't remember the day or the month or whatever it was. I never wrote that down. I was never told to, so I never did. But I remember it, and I thought, good, I'm a Christian now. And then I went on, and I just I lived so wickedly. And it's a terrible, terrible thing what these church buildings do to people. They get you in, and they give you the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and they forsake that personal relationship. And that's why these church buildings are so filled with corruption. And the lost world looks at it, and they go, that's Christianity. Don't want anything to do with it. But the reality of it is, lost people that are saying that aren't really looking for the truth. It's an old saying, you can't con a man unless that man is crooked. You know, some guy comes along and says, I can show you how to make, you know, $5,000 a week from your living room. You know, a good person will look at that and they'll go, no, sorry, I got to work hard, you know, out there and stuff, you know, got to go out and work and things. But somebody that's crooked is going to go, oh, really? Hmm, I can make $5,000 a week or something like this from my living? They're crooked. Lost people that look about hypocrites in the church, it's because they're a hypocrite. There's something wrong with them that they want to look for fault out there. They want to look for the hypocrites, the false professing Christians, and say, see, that's Christianity. I don't have to be involved in it. You're trying to cover up for your own rotten self. But you know, you got to realize that you're dealing with a holy, righteous God that is going to judge you one day. He's going to judge your secrets. He's going to judge your thoughts according to the Bible. The Bible says both things. Judging your secrets, judging your thoughts, your very thoughts. And all you have to do is come to Him and say, Lord, I mean, you don't have to go out and just experience everything and just totally just be a total miserable wretch to get saved. You know, you don't have to do a whole lot of sins to get saved. All you have to do is just come to Him and say, God, I know I need to be saved. I, I've done enough in my life to know that I'm a sinner and know, know that this stuff is negative. I don't want this life of sin anymore. Please save me. I had to come to that place and realize my profession of being a Christian was false. And that's my prayer for anybody out there that's watching this study, that you would look at the Scriptures. Share one other verse of Scripture. This isn't in my original notes, but I'm going to share one other verse of Scripture. This is very important. But I want you to get to a point where you examine yourself and see, am I in the faith? Am I genuinely saved? 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 Actually, we'll start in verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record, written word of God, that God gave of his Son. 
And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You say, well, this is the written, the, 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 the record. It's not written. It's just the record that's there. I, I can see him in nature. And Keep reading. Verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you know that you're saved? You say, well, I'm part of the, the, the church that Jesus Christ founded. I'm part of the Holy Catholic Church, the, the one true church. Are you going to go to heaven when you die? Well, I have reason to believe that if I die in a state of grace, I didn't ask that. I said, do you know that you're saved? Well, I'm not going to get saved if you talk to me this way. Do you realize the insanity of that? You're in a house burning and some firefighter comes and he's screaming and yelling, come over to the window, come here, I'll help you out. I don't appreciate your tone of voice. You yelled at me. <laughs> what? You know, are you saved? Do you know that you have eternal life? Do you know? Well, nobody can really know for sure. The Bible says you can. Written record right here. You say, well, it's just a translation. I don't believe that that book is actually God's word. Okay, then go to hell. You can't know that you're going to go to heaven unless you believe the written record that God gave of His Son. See, that's why I'm so opposed to this new version mindset out there. That's why I'm a King James Bible-believing Christian. I'm not King James only. Don't ever confuse me with that. I got a whole bunch of new versions down here. I got Greek texts. I got all kinds of stuff. Here's Nestles and Texas Receptus and all this other stuff here. I got all that stuff. I'm not King James only. I'm a King James Bible believer. I've put this book to the test. I used new versions that whole time I was a false convert. Easier to understand and everything else, and I was going to hell. I believe that this book is God's Word. Do you? Well, I don't have to be. Yes, you do. The only way that you can know that you have eternal life is if you believe the written record of God's Son. You say, oh, I'm a Muslim. Do you know that you're going to go to heaven? I don't believe in heaven. I know, you know, things like that. Paradise. Do you know you have eternal life? The Bible says you can know. What's wrong with you if you don't know it? Haven't given up on your system yet. You're following some man. What did he ever do to you? Or do, do for you, I should say it that way. What did Muhammad ever do for you if you're a Muslim? Showed you the way of truth. Please. So did every other false teacher out there. Did he die for you? Jesus died for me. And I've accepted him as my Savior. My Lord and Savior. Have you accepted? Or are you going to put your faith in something else? That's going to be it for this study. I just don't understand why people can listen to preaching. They can see what the Word of God says. They can look up these scriptures for themselves and still say, just haven't had enough of the world yet. Just haven't had enough of my own self-righteousness yet. I'm just going to keep trying some things. Yeah, Brian, I, I understand. I know you love the Lord. I know that you care about me and everything else. But, you know, I'm just not totally convinced yet. I'm just going to keep experimenting with the world. I'm just going to try some things. Because, you know, I think that happiness is just around the corner. You're going to mess around. You're going to mess around and mess around. Not believe this book. And you're going to find out someday, when it's too late, that this book was the truth. And all those times that you rejected Jesus Christ and clung to your self-righteousness, all those times are going to haunt you for eternity. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.